Alhamdulillah, we can gather here together this morning in such a fortunate event of Friday morning lecture on biorefinery. Already present here with us is Professor Ramaraj Bhupati from Nicole State University, USA, to give the talk. And I'm very thankful for Professor Raj as we actually have 13 hours different. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it is uh, in the evening in the US now. And I will first introduce Professor Raj Bhupati. He is the LC Fortier Distinguished Service Professor and John Brady Senior and John Brady Junior and Professor in Nicole State University, Louisiana, US, in the Department of Biological Science. He did his bachelor to master uh, to doctoral degree in India and go to various parts of the world before uh, settled in US. And he is the editor of many reputable journal, environmental quality and management, current pollution report, applied science, and I cannot mention all of them because there are so many. And his field of interest are antibiotic resident, uh, resistance, microbiology, bioremediation, ethanol production and biodegradation and well there's a long list of achievement but last year he got uh, he was awarded world-class professor from indonesian government that is the most important for us because we are in indonesia and without further delay uh we would like to welcome Professor Raj to give the talk on lignocellulosic bioethanol and microbial lipid for bioenergy. Okay, Professor Raj, the time is yours. All right. Thanks, uh, Dr. Penia. It's uh, good to see you all. And uh, today, this is my fourth lecture in this uh, lecture series. And today I'm going to talk about biofuels and uh, mostly lignocellulosic ethanol. Um, let me uh, share my slides, um, get my slides open. Yes. Yeah, all right. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about because of the mixed audience students in different um, you know, classifications from graduate student to undergrad, I'm gonna start with some basic, um, what is ethanol, what is cellulosic ethanol, and then talk about the current technology uh, in the US at commercial level, and then uh, uh, complete my talk with my uh, personal research on this field, uh, how we're gonna use this uh, lignocellulosic material holistically, and uh, not only the sugar, but also lignin, um, using microbial lipid as, uh, using lignin to convert the microbial lipid. So I'm gonna start with basic and, and finish with the applied uh, research, okay? Um, so first of all, green, green technology is the buzzword now. Green technology is uh, continuously evolving a group of methods, uh, constantly developing. People are uh, um, you know, finding new methods, uh, not only generating energy to also various processes, including non-toxic cleaning products. Uh, the most urgent issue here is the alternative fuels uh, because the petroleum is going to run out eventually. So you need to find other, other fuel sources. Uh, especially the renewable ones. So uh, green technology in the alternative fuel is uh, um, used to be a really uh, hot topic, but um, it's catching up again after we go through this oil, petroleum oil price come down. Now we are getting again back on the research. So it's a, if you look at this green technology, it, it encompasses a lot of things. It uh, does the sustainability, uh, it also does source reduction of waste material and innovation, of course. There are a lot of new ideas, new uh, methods developed, and also socioeconomic aspect of it and uh, viability, uh, cradle to cradle design. So it, it's really a good deal. It a holistic approach, uh, it combines a lot of things, green technology. Okay. So let's talk about ethanol. So ethanol is this molecule, C2H5. Um, uh, or, or two, the, this one is the molecular model. And we have this, since it has oxygen, it is a better uh, burning fuel, right? So you, you, you actually blend 10% ethanol um, in US in all the gasoline product nowadays. 
So if you look at the fermentation reaction, uh, the st uh, starting material is sugar, uh, mostly glucose, and then yeast convert glucose to ethanol and carbon dioxide. That's a simple design. Um, but you also get uh, two molecules of carbon dioxide from one molecule of glucose and two molecules of ethanol you get. And just to show you uh, the structure of uh, how it goes through the pyruvate and through glycolysis, and then you have uh, ethanol production through acetaldehyde. So just to show you the simple uh, uh, schematic, so from glucose through glycolysis, uh, molecule current to pyruvate, and the yeast gets two ATP for its energy source, and then pyruvate is converted to acetaldehyde, and then acetaldehyde converted to ethanol, and this NAD is uh, constantly recycled, um, going back to um, you know, generate more ATP. So this is a simplistic view of um, the, the biochemistry in glucose uh, fermentation to ethanol. Um, uh, if you look at grain ethanol, it, it, uh, it basically comes from grain. In US, it's mostly corn. And uh, then other countries uh, in Brazil, they use sugarcane and then uh, other grains as well. And potatoes is another source you get um, anywhere, any, any material that has starch, you could use it for this purpose. Okay. So it's a very energy efficient, it's 25% uh, it more energy than is used to grow, harvest and distill into it. So if you look at energy output, energy input ratio, uh, it, it's, it's, it's positive side, 1.6 is the um, ratio okay, from output to input. Now, if you compare gasoline with, uh, with the ethanol, the ethanol is very comparable. So octane and number in E85, 85% uh, ethanol um, um, fuel is 100 compared to gasoline 86 to 94. Um, the fuel source of gasoline is crude oil, but here you have a variety of um, agriculture product you could use. And BTU is also comparable with 70% uh, uh, of energy ratio in ethanol and both are liquid. So we need liquid fuel for our transportation purpose. So it's really good. A uh, little bit more biochemistry. So the starting material is uh, corn or, or potato, any starch material. So you have to hydrolyze and convert them to sugar. <clears throat> and then and glucose is um, through glycolysis, you convert uh, yeast, convert it to pyruvate. And then we use pyruvate decarboxylase, uh, convert pyruvate to acetaldehyde and then alcohol D hydrogenase uh, convert acetaldehyde to ethanol. It's just a um, simple biochemical pathway. And just to show what are the enzymes involved, uh, you need to have convert starch to glucose, you need amylase, um, uh, and then from glucose to pyruvate, uh, the ATP is uh, transferred, and then you have pyruvate for oxidase, oxidoreductase enzyme, convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, and acetyl acetyl convert acetyl-CoA to acetaldehyde. So, and then um, acetaldehyde and the enzyme ethanol dehydrogenase convert them to ethanol. So these are various steps in fermentation reaction. So if you look at holistically, so uh, most of the yeast use the um, six, car six carbon sugar um, a fermentation, and we also have pentose using sugar, uh, yeast like Pythia stipidus, okay? So we have uh, the, the process of glycolysis and also assimilation process, yeast use them to generate energy, fermentation reaction, and then pentose phosphate pathway. So if you look at it, so you have from hexose sugar transporter can transport the sugar inside the yeast, and then from there it goes through um, for, uh, glycolysis process. And then if it, you start with uh, five carbon, you go through the pentose sugar transporter, um, transport them inside the xylose, and from there it convert them. If you look at all of them, end up in pyruvate. And then pyruvate um, uh, involved uh, converting them to acetaldehyde and ethanol. So this is, um, you know, just put them all the reaction together so you can do six carbon and five carbon depending on the yeast strain. And also now we use the, uh, uh, the um, modern uh, gene technology to put one organism can do both uh, five carbon, six carbon metabolism. Um, in a bioprocessing standpoint, uh, you get your raw material, then go through milling, and then a big hydrolysis process, you add enzyme, amylase to convert the, um, all the um, uh, starch into sugar. 
and then you put a big fermentation tank and use yeast to ferment and then you do product separation and then you use a co-product and use dry distillers grind for various purpose like you know feed for animals and all that so this is just a, a bioprocessing steps involved in converting grain um, uh, corn, ethan corn ethanol in us so just more steps to show you um, making grain ethanol in dry milling. So you need to grind it up, make a liquefaction step to mix with water and heat them and make a mash out of that to starch. And then you have a saccharification step to add amylase to convert them to sugar. And then you, you add yeast and to start your fermentation. And then, then yeast can do this job, produce ethanol and CO2. And then you do the processing at the other end where you distillate separate ethanol and then dehydrate and denature, make sure it is unfit for human consumption. And then you do co-products um, to use that like distillers grind for livestock feed and CO2 can be compressed and used in many different ways. So this is different steps involved in um, grain ethanol. And this is a very mature technology. In the US, we have uh, more than 200 commercial plant. If you look at all this, um, uh, plant located. Most of them are in Midwestern state. This is where the corn production is. And um, we produce seven to eight billion gallon of ethanol every year from this corn ethanol alone. So this technology is mature and, uh, and it's really doing well. Okay. But cellulosic ethanol is a different, uh, uh, you know, uh, animal itself. So there's a lot of steps involved because of pretreatment. Um, of course, it starts with the uh, plant material. It's uh, made from plants are made of cellulose. Cellulose provides structure to the plant. So you need to get the cellulose out of this lignin cellulose complex. And we can put, use any uh, plant biomass, uh, uh, agriculture residue, um, um, our, our, you know, sawdust, Paper and pulp, paper pulp, and and some crops that is we can call energy crop like switchgrass and all that. So you can use any biomass for this uh, cellulosic ethanol uh, uh, production. The concept is simple. So you get the residue. You need to do pretreatment steps to delignify, remove the lignin, and release the cellulose and hemicellulose. And then you do enzymatic hydrolysis, get your sugar so from uh, cellulose to get um, glucose, from hemicellulose to get uh, xylosic sugar. And then the step, once you get your sugar, the steps are the same, fermentation and processing, and you get it. So that's a con simple concept of lignocellic. So the steps here are this um, pretreatment step and enzymatic um, hydrolysis step that is more involved and uh, it costs more. And it's one of those uh, you know, uh, limiting steps in this process. Um, so when you get all these feedstock, you can either do biochemical conversion, which is what I just um, showed you. And also you can do thermochemical conversion. So thermochemical conversion is involved pyrolysis, gasification, like Fischer trope. Um, and then you, you get variety of product through refining, not only ethanol, you can be, uh, get butanol, olefin, gasoline, diesel, and then you can use the, the lignin as a cogen for generating electricity. So not only biochemical, you can also use thermochemical conversion from uh, feed, various feedstock. So it's a, the ethanol is good mainly because it contains um, oxygen. Uh, adding oxygen to fuel is, you know, give you complete fuel combustion. And so as a result, um, we have 10% of gas um, ethanol is added as a blend in the US currently. Brazil has all the way to E85, 85% uh, ethanol there. Uh, the advantage of adding ethanol with the oxygenated fuel is um, you reduce your carbon monoxide emission and particulate matter emission like 50% and volatile organic compound emission reduced by 7%. So it's like a air pollution control. So it's another advantage of using ethanol as your biofuel. So if you look at the projection from US, uh, from cellulosic material, how much ethanol can be made? Just from agriculture waste alone, they're projecting to make 50 billion gallons of ethanol. But potentially, you can make 80 billion gallons from all the residues that uh, they make from um, various crops in the US. 
if you use the energy crop like switchgrass and other energy crop in marginal land, you cultivate this energy crop and use it for uh, cellulosic ethanol, you can make 165 billion gallon ethanol per year. Okay. And that's more than uh, enough for the country's need. And uh, so this is what they're trying to go through in this route. And we had a hiccup in Trump uh, administration. Everything came to a stop, but hopefully this uh, research will go back again and try to achieve these goals. So the motivation of uh, bioenergy is threefold. Um, you can use the uh, damaged part of the stock and also the residue that is uh, coming from agriculture operation for the energy production. And as I said, it's less air pollution from vehicle because of the, the oxygenated fuel and also less uh, burning of crop after farmers um, harvest the um, crop, they, they burn the crop for the next year uh, plowing next year um, agriculture operation. So as a result, every year um, the fields are burned and uh, you get pollution, air pollution. So the, you, you have motivation to uh, reduce air pollution um, and also you have um, you know, energy security as well. So this just to show you an example in India, every year uh, we have the smog uh, from burning rice crop. And also in China, we they have have smog uh, in Beijing. So it's just to show you uh, pictures of um, air pollution from agriculture burning operation. Uh, this is the recurring theme. Every year we have this problem and nobody's addressing it. Um, so the, uh, the process involved is not only just to make ethanol, then you have to do distribution and end use. So it's like a lot of people are involved in this um, steps, not only um, scientists, but engineers and economists and you know, business people involved. So if you're gonna make uh, more lignocellulosic ethanol, if you're gonna um, uh, use land uh, to produce more uh, fuel crop, then initially you're gonna generate more greenhouse gas because you're gonna plow the land, put the biomass in there, uh, plant in there, you're gonna have some PM emission going to go up initially, but eventually it's gonna, you know, uh, can be uh, neutralized uh, because the land is going to be continuously used. Uh, so if you're preparing the land initially, initially you're going to you know, have some pollution problem. So if you look at the uh, biomass itself, it's, it's a new crude. Um, sugar is the crude, biomass also is the crude. Um, so it basically, petroleum was one time is a biomass, right? Uh, all the petroleum products are started with biomass uh, one time. So same ingredient that made oil is what we are using now. Um, so the, we're gonna speed up the process, the waste materials to create uh, renewable energy. So you could start with a lot of different crops, waste material, biochemical conversion to get your sugar, go through fermentation, catalysis, and then you can produce a lot of things, not only uh, energy, but also other sugar platform, you can put other chemicals, fine chemicals you can make. Okay. So it's a, it's a, sugar is a new crude according to American Petroleum Institute. So the energy demand is keep going up uh, worldwide. And if you look at it, um, um, the, the, the two most uh, country that use energy high is China and US, and then we have um, Europe and India are, are in the top four countries. Uh, the demand is going to keep going up every year. So we need to find new energy for the masses. So the projection of the energy is if you look compared 2011 to 2040, the petroleum uh, energy source is going to go down, um, uh, coming from 37% to 31%. Um, and then you're going to have the biomass going to go up. Uh, according to the International Energy Research Institute. And so you can just to show you, um, you're gonna have new uh, non-conventional sources um, is the major source um, in, in the future, okay? Because you're gonna deplete your um, petroleum reserve um, eventually, you're gonna run out of it. So the imbalance is uh, supply and demand, uh, I feel. Um, so you need to kind of balance this out. Um, why? Because people are moving to big cities. And um, so if you, this is how it was in the la last century, um, in, in 1900. Now, you know, cities look like this. 
Uh, so increase in urbanization, change in lifestyle. So your energy demand is going to be high. So you need to have a liquid fuel for your transportation currently. That's uh, hopefully that will change because of electric car. Um, so a solution for all this is currently it's biofuel, okay? Uh, probably 50 years from now, it could be different. Um, so biofuel is the energy demand right now. The computer is acting up. Uh, let's get this here. So um, let's look at uh, how you can, what are the different biofuel you can make? Uh, you can make a liquid biofuel, you can make gases biofuel. So not only ethanol, you can make biobutanol, um, uh, biodiesel, biomethane, biohydrogen in the, in the gaseous forms in gas, and methane and hydrogen we call biohydrogen. So these are various possibilities. So currently we're going to talk about ethanol, but we are people also uh, look into other energy um, so production. So one more um, uh, slide about advantage of bioethanol is, uh, is, is threefold, as I said, is better for the environment, better use of product from agriculture and food security. And you have, um, you know, all this carbon neutral, better biodegradation, less air pollution, greenhouse gas emission, uh, reduced dependence on oil. So you have energy security and diversification of agriculture. So you have taken care of the rural economy. So people in the rural um, side. Uh, so my computer is acting up today. Um, rural areas can also be taken care of by participating in this field. And you can have this um, energy, a uh, lot of different product, and you can also make fine chemicals. Once you get the sugar, you can, you know, through bioprocessing, you can make a lot of product, whatever in demand. Sorry about that. I think I'm going to go with this here. Um, so, uh, so you already know what is um, uh, this classification of the fuel. The first gen is corn ethanol mainly, um, and then we have second gen, which is lignocellulosic. Third gen biofuel is all the biofuels, and then fourth one is uh, biohydrogen. Okay. Uh, if you look at this uh, various crop that we call it uh, second generation substrate, and you can grow them in um, uh, on, on barren, uncultivable land. So the, the land that are not usually used for agriculture, you can use them, this biomass crop, because they, they don't need um, better conditions, okay? Uh, you need less amount of water to grow. Um, uh, it's not going to interfere with the food chain, so there is no food versus fuel uh, debate here. Um, there are a lot of lignocellulosic biomass can be cultivated in this day, so you have more um, resources available. Okay. Um, so if you look at the biomass, the problem is this: uh, getting the lignin removed and get the uh, these two sugar-containing complex out, cellulose and hemicellulose. Okay. So if you look at the biomass itself, the major component of it is um, uh, lignin, hemicellulose, and uh, cellulose. And depending on the crop and the biomass, it varies. Uh, so yeah, up to 50% in some crops, uh, crop and cellulose. So these are the three major ones. So we can use the sugar, and then we could use lignin for other purposes. So in my case, I'm going to use lignin to make uh, microbial lipids. Okay. So how, how this is all started in a big way, it started because in during Bush administration, second Bush, um, we had this oil price went up almost $100, $110 a barrel. So the President Bush promoted um, cellulosic ethanol concept and then uh, President Obama took it forward and gave a lot of incentive, a um, lot of companies put commercial plant and then politics change and now everything is uh, yeah, not doing well. Uh, so hopefully it will do well in the future. So I want to just give some basic uh, facts about this. Um, uh, so we do not need energy, but we need uh, services that energy provides. Uh, those services are you know, heat, light, mobility, and mobility you need this liquid fuel currently, right? Um, so energy has fundamentally different qualities. So all uh, BTUs are not created equal. Um, our society will literally stop if there is no liquid fuel currently. So we need, there is a demand for liquid fuel. So liquid fuels um, 
uh, uh, not energy required for mobility for the for, for at least few decades at least you know electric cars are picking up but uh, at least for you know few more decades we need liquid fuel so just to show you the whole society will come to stop if uh, if you don't have a liquid fuel available and okay. um, if you look at all energy carriers um, um, have not have say um, do not have equal strategic importance uh, because of, uh, if you look at different energy like coal, US and China have plenty of them, right? And domestic resources. And natural go uh, gas, you have a lot from Canada and Mexico, and petroleum. Um, uh, during this energy crisis, 60% was imported, but cur currently, the US is an um, uh, energy exporting country because of, um, you know, drill baby drill. Um, uh, last few years, we've been drilling everywhere, even in national park and um, and also fracking uh, the new way to get shale um, um, petroleum from shale so we are predicting more but but few people are predicting this is not going to last long okay and um, so it's going to that's why we need to have uh, uh, alternative because petroleum can undermine a lot of things climate security economic security and international security and world stability so so all countries need to have their own energy um, independence. So the biofuel and liquid um, cellulosic ethanol is a way to go, um, according to many, many, many scientists. Okay. Um, so the cellulosic ethanol is the you know uh, alternative to bio petroleum. Uh, for these reasons, as I said, um, national security, greenhouse gas reduction, and economic advantage. And also uh, the the presentation of uh, emphasize in this particular talk, I'm going to talk about cellulose ethanol from various biomasses. So again, go through one more time the schematic. This is the schematic for ethanol from corn. We get corn kernels and um, go through the um, hydrolysis and um, get sugar and fermentation process, and and you do distillation, drying, and get ethanol get ethanol out. And then you get co-product that goes to mainly animal feed in US. And this is sugar cane, like in Brazil. Uh, sugar comes out of sugar cane and goes straight through this process, uh, almost the same. You, you have this, because of the sugar, you don't have this hydrolysis step for the sugar cane. Um, and then if you look at the, um, um, the cellulosic ethanol, we have a lot of steps involved, uh, pretreatment, um, hydrolysis, and then once you get the sugar, the process is the same. There is no difference. Okay. And then um, you can also include the thermochemical conversion. So you get the, after pretreatment, you get the solids and use this thermochemical conversion to get heat power and, and fuel and chemicals. Okay. Um, if you look at all commodity, um, that are uh, the, the the price of this uh, uh, energy is based on raw material, how much is going to cost the feedstock and the processing, right? So when you started in gasoline, initially the cost was uh, getting the raw material, and um, and then the processing costs keep going down in the future. So. So the same thing we are predicting for lignosic cellulose, uh, lignosic ethanol uh, production. Um, how much is going to cost the raw material and what is the processing cost? Um, the processing cost is going to uh, going to go down because of technology, because of research. Okay. Um, so we have this margin to play with, depending this um, cellulose ethanol is tied to the gasoline price. Um, so. The gasoline price fluctuate if you look at last 20 years. Uh, you know, um, so we have this big fluctuation. So we can, uh, so we need to have a stable price. Um, that's why these companies that are set up to make this are failing currently because petrol is cheap. Uh, or right currently, it's really cheap here. So you had to have the price for the raw material and then the processing cars. If you look at the um, Initial uh, petroleum energy um, started. Uh, there was the cost for the oil was less, but processing was high. And then all this uh, refining uh, research uh, reduced the cost of processing. 
and then uh, because then the dwindling energy supply. So now your raw material is going to be going to cost more, and your processing costs less. So, so this is the same scenario we are looking at in cellulose. Initially, processing going to cost. Once the technology mature, your processing costs going to go down. But the same way it played for petroleum industry. So just to show that, that's what happened in Brazil. In Brazil, when it started this whole um, ethanol, ethanol production there, energy independent country, so the ethanol cost went down um, because of the processing um, cost went down and um, because of research and technology um, to make this possible. So we are, we are uh, advocating the same principle for uh, the lignocellulosic cellulosic uh, ethanol production as well. So here is today's cost. You know, if you look at it, the processing is more because of enzyme cost, pretreatment steps, all that gonna cost more, and uh, biomass price is less. But in the future, we are predicting because of the technology and science, this cost gonna go down and, and the biomass is gonna be, the cost gonna go up, production of the biomass gonna go up, okay? So a very similar principle is what is expected in, um, in the future. So when, when the cellulose ethanol was at uh, peak here, like 10 years ago, we had these commercial companies set up shop in the US. They were producing commercially from um, corn store and, uh, and they, use different pretreatment. The one of the successful one was Apex um, uh, pretreatment. I'm gonna talk about it in a minute. Uh, but currently all of them uh, are, are bankrupt because of political change and oil price. So, so, so we had so, so many success story and then um, it, it, again, it, it follows the price of oil. So, so if you look at the, the process itself, uh, you, you get your biomass and uh, you, you have the harvesting, storage, size reduction, and then you have the pretreatment step and then and you, the enzyme, uh, you need to have enzyme production and then uh, hydro, um, hydrolysis step and you get the sugar and then you get the fermentation of sugar to make your ethanol. And then you have the residue and the waste treatment. So this is the com complete picture of how all these commercial company, um, you know, did this process, okay? But the pretreatment step was different for different companies, okay? So this is the whole view. We get the uh, harvesting storage, and so um, size reduction of biomass, transportation to the field, and that's, that's an all cost involved. And then pretreatment and um, then the process, these steps are um, almost similar, but the pretreatment and Enzymatic step are different depending on um, a different company. So one of the successful pretreatment was is Apex, uh, which is the ammonia fiber expansion method. Uh, so we use um, uh, they use ammonia and for a pretreatment step in a reactor. So when you heat the biomass at 100 degree with concentrated ammonia, you have a um, rapid pressure that release the end treatment. As a result, you get the sugar release, but there is no other inhibitors. That's one of the advantage of FX. There is no perfural for uh, uh, 5-hydroxymethyl perfural, no inhibitors produced during FX process. So this is very successfully used commercially and uh, people are um, hoping this is the way to go in most of the Midwestern states in the US. So they did a lot of uh, comparison. So the, there's a price for using dilute acid pretreatment, um, hot water, and then here's the FX. $1.41 per gallon of ethanol. Um, and then you can compare with other um, pretreatment process. So this, this method um, is commercially used in three different companies and very successfully. Um, and the costs also went down because you can reduce ammonia and recycle ammonia. Uh, then you can also reduce capital costs um, doing FX analysis. I'm gonna do a couple of modeling and see how this price is gonna go down, okay? Currently they're pricing at $1.41 per gallon of ethanol during FX process, okay? And this is the NREL model, uh, National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, and then if you look at the price in the future by consolidated bioprocessing, you can make ethanol at 62 cents 
uh, a gallon. This is a model they're predicting. And also uh, go below 60 cents you know, when the technology mature, okay? So they're hoping this model will compete with the oil petroleum price. And this is going to take off in, in the new administration um, coming up. Um, if you look at uh, what is happening because of the in inexpensive ethanol, you have um, other problems we have, um, uh, environmental improvement possible, um, rural economy is in the US, uh, uh, all the rural people are really dying out though there's nothing to live for. So we are hoping this technology will revive the economy in the rural area. And um, uh, also you have more food for the animal because of the distillers and the grain that comes out through the process, you get animal feed possible. So th these are additional um, uh, incentive to develop this technology and people are pushing for this uh, in the US currently. Um, so the Michigan State University come up with this plan um, if you uh, if if this uh, uh, technology uh, has to be you know taken up nationwide and also internationally, you need to have this uh, set up in small rural areas uh, like like a cooperative, so you, you can reduce the transportation costs so to get the biomass to this plant. So you set up this regional biomass processing center, and then get your pretreatment going, uh, and then you can make. Um, a lot of product, uh, you get your high value um, users and you can get, um, you know, the waste, whatever waste you can do, cogen per power plant, and then you have a biorefinery to make your ethanol. So this this is uh, available in, in the Michigan State University website, and this model is what they are predicting is uh, the future for this industry. Then there are certain myths out there. Um, I just want to uh, clear some of those. Uh, so myth number one is ethanol has negative net energy. Um, in reality, gasoline's net energy is worse than ethanol. Uh, if you compare this metric, uh, is not uh, is not relevant. Okay. Another myth is ethanol will drive up food prices because the, the debate of food versus fuel is a little complicated. Uh, there is no easy uh, sound bite for this. Um, but cellulosic ethanol will, you know, will not compete with food because we are looking at the biomass and waste from agriculture operation, and it reduces the greenhouse gas and air pollution. Um, the another myth is ethanol is bad for the environment. Uh, what we are comparing to what we are saying ethanol is bad. Uh, the, if you look at corn ethanol, it's actually superior to gasoline um, for most metrics. And uh, cellulose ethanol is even will be better because again, we are using base product mostly. Uh, ethanol will uh, always cost more than gasoline. Uh, currently it is true, but ethanol from corn, we are making um, in the commercial sector, they're making a dollar 20 a gallon. Uh, from cellulose, as, as the model indicate, you can make 60 cents a gallon. So, so these are what they are hoping could happen to this industry and it's going to pick up again. Okay. So the another part was um, getting this lignin out of the um, out of the biomass to get the sugar. So mostly people are working on pretreatment of chemicals like acid, alkaline, ionic liquids, and um, but we can also use biological um, uh, processes using fungi uh, to remove the lignin. Uh, so you can combine these two uh, methods, uses a little bit of acid treatment also combined with the uh, uh, fungal enzyme to remove the lignin. So, so if you look at it, there's a lot of fungal enzyme, lacases and peroxidases could be used. And um, so just to show um, why the lignin is there in the first place to protect the plant. And now we can use this um, fungal enzyme to you know, use this in this technology. So we can uh, uh, use this um, pretreatment and you can use this uh, fungal uh, as a biological pretreatment method and try to reduce the price of the whole technology. So I'm going to talk about that in my research. Uh, just to show you, there are a lot of pretreatment out there. 
um, these are the acid alkaline and then physical chemical method and enzymatic method. And the two commonly used method, uh, uh, the one is the ammonia fiber expansion, which is already commercialized in US and ionic liquid pretreatment is also good, but it is expensive currently, um, it, but commercially not uh, um, possible compared to uh, uh, FX process. And uh, I'm advocating biological pretreatment using um, various fungus because the, these fungi uh, produce a lot of these enzymes, manganese peroxidase, ligand peroxidase, and lactases. Um, so we can use uh, some of these fungi that are high efficient. Um, biologically, they can remove lignins. Okay. Um, it's also, um, you know, it's very targeted. <clears throat> These enzymes only attack lignin, so the sugar is not degraded. Uh, so if you stop the reaction, then you can get the whole sugar and you don't have any inhibitor that is uh, uh, produced during this process. Uh, you can easily recover the enzyme and reuse the enzyme, so the, the cost will go up. Another advantage of using biological um, pretreatment using uh, enzyme is this water uh, um, reduction. So if you look at all these methods, um, you're using a lot of water in pretreatment. But if you, if you use the biological method, the water usage is very, very less, all right? So you produce less waste, you consume less uh, uh, water in the whole processes. So this is the way that I advocate in my research to use biological pretreatment using fungal enzymes. Um, just to show you the enzymes involved, a uh, lot of different enzymes um, you can use in, in, your, in the process, but generally those are all lactases, manganese peroxidase, um, all those enzymes are commonly used, okay? And we can also, people are looking at novel enzyme from different sources, uh, like termite, um, different grubs, cr uh, in insects, and they're looking at um, microbes inside their guts because these are all uh, biomass processing insect. They eat this uh, plant material and so they're trying to get some novel enzymes. So uh, currently the trichotomerisi is the, the, the one that they industrially used for um, enzyme for the getting hydrolysis, but uh, people are also looking at different um, sources to get uh, novel enzymes. So again, uh, you need to get the lignin out, release this um, cellulose using the cellulase enzyme. So you can get them from various sources. And when you do that, and this is how the biological uh, pretreatment look like. Uh, you get your biomass, uh, you get your um, you know, process your biomass in the powder form or whatever form that uh, is cost effective. And then use this uh, enzyme to delignify. Uh, you, uh, you can use the whole fungus or you can use the uh, enzyme out of the fungus and process it. And then you, uh, that will get your sugar out. And then you have this bioethanol uh, production from various sugar and you get your uh, ethanol from uh, lignocellulose. So uh, my research is to uh, combine one of those chemical method and the biological method to make it more efficient. So that's what um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, from my personal research. So just to show you, uh, if you use these enzymes, you can see the picture, uh, raw biomass and pretreated biomass, you can see what these enzymes can do to get the lignin out and make this structure uh, after it is pretreated with these enzymes. Um, so. Um, it, it less water use is a better method. Enzyme can be recycled. It's also cost effective, okay? So with this broad overview uh, on uh, how this corn ethanol, cellulosic ethanol, and some commercial plant already in the US, and they started and then now bankrupt, and hopefully they'll go back because of uh, um, the bioprocessing cost is coming down through research, okay? So I was involved uh, seven, eight years ago um, uh, in this uh, field. I, my research was funded by Department of Energy. Um, uh, so I'm gonna share some of my uh, research with you in this field, okay? So as I said, my research was to reduce the cost 
So you want to combine the biological method with the chemical method for pretreatment. So you can reduce the cost and make it more economically viable, this process. So we, uh, uh, I don't have to go through this, we already talked about why we talk, uh, we use the fuel, liquid fuel, because it's mainly for transportation purpose. And then this uh, liquid fuel um, from the energy source, we, uh, it's uh, also carbon neutral. Once this process mature, once you get new land into cultivable land, um, then you can see most of them will be uh, carbon will be recycled and become carbon neutral and release less CO2 and less greenhouse gases. Okay. Um, so this is, uh, uh, currently we account for you now 1% of world energy from demand from biofuel. I'm hoping this, this number is gonna go up uh, when, when new government takes up uh, in the US. Uh, so we need to make uh, uh, more uh, ethanol more economically viable and feasible. So this was an old figure. When I started the research, the DOE wanted to have this 60 billion gallon ethanol production and they wanted to get this $2.33. Uh, at that time, the oil price was high. Uh, but now, you know, it's now they want to have a dollar twenty. So, so that's a new figure. So I was involved in um, the sugarcane uh, as a raw material because Louisiana is a sugarcane producing uh, state. Uh, one of the major crop is sugarcane. And um, so, so you, we have a lot of this, uh, after sugarcane harvest, we have this uh, leaf litter on the ground. Um, currently they burn it. So you can collect this uh, leaf and use it for ligand ethanol production. And we can also use energy cane. So there are some, Sugar cane that are classified as energy cane because it has more um, cellulose and um, hemicellulose. Uh, and this can be grown year around and it, it can be also grown in um, non arable land because they, they're disease tolerant. And there are a lot of advantage of using this uh, energy cane. So just to show you there are different types of sugar cane. This is commercial sugar cane. This is energy cane one, energy cane two. You can see the difference in cellulose, semicellulose, and sugar content uh, in this crop, okay? So there are varieties, um, different varieties we used. I'm gonna talk about the one variety um, that uh, part of my research because of time, okay? Um, so we, we collected this uh, type Seven, which is energy can two from the uh, USDA research station um, for our research. We brought it to the lab and dried it and uh, processed it um, to do your pretreatment step. Again, just to show you, um, we need to remove the lignin, get the cellulose and hemicellulose out. You can use chemical or biological pretreatment. So once you get cellulose, it's 100% um, glucose, right? So once you get the hydrolytic steps, the cellulose can be broken down to get your sugar. Um, and then when you remove hemicellulose, you have this pentose and hexose um, that makes hemicellulose, you commonly call xylose. We get all the sugar released that could be used in your fermentation process. And then we have uh, this lignin, right? Uh, lignin could be uh, in the other process they use in cogen, uh, but I'm proposing to use this lignin using specific bacteria to make uh, microbial um, lipids, which could be used as biodiesel. So uh, the re my research is using everything uh, from the biomass, the sugar, both pentose and exosic sugar, and also um, the lignin for microbial lipid production. Uh, this is just a, a cartoon to show how the steps work, uh, get your pretreatment, get your enzymatic digestion, fermentation, distillation. Um, so what type of enzyme to use to get your um, uh, sugar released. Okay. So my, our objective was to try this uh, particular type to energy cane. Uh, when I compare various pretreatment combined with biological treatment optimize the condition, and then um, how best we can use the biological and one of these pretreatment methods in our research. 
Um, so we started in small scale um, and we used the acid-free treatment um, and using sulfuric acid, weak sulfuric acid, and then we you know, processed it and then we get the lignin out of the um, pre-treatment steps. And then we use enzymatic step to get the, the glucose out for fermentation. And then we use uh, various fungus. Uh, we use the whole fungus, uh, white rot fungus, brown rot fungus, and then we use this solid state uh, fungal treatment. And this method was uh, uh, advocated by uh, um, Dr. Rani Suhadi when she visited uh, here as a Fulbright scholar. So this is from her research. Uh, so we started using this method, uh, whole fungal uh, inoculation and look at softening of the lignin. Uh, and then they have enzymatic saccharification step. We use this different enzyme for cellulosic enzyme and xylanase for hemicellulosic. So we get both um, pentose and hexose out of this biomass. Uh, we used uh, first yeast and then we used the recombinant E. coli. This recombinant E. coli can uh, ferment both pentose and um, uh, hexose sugar, so we can uh, have better yield. Okay? So just to show you, uh, just a pretreatment alone, comparing um, different uh, acid pretreatment. So if you look at uh, you know four percent versus one uh, percent. Um, four percent was uh, half acid volume by weight worked better um, in terms of ethanol. We, we're not using anything else, no enzymatic step, just pretreatment, whatever sugar that come out. Um, so you can see that um, between three and four, there is no significant difference in ethanol yield. So we advocated three percent sulfuric acid uh, could be the better way to go for this pretreatment step for this particular biomass. And we also want to compare whether alkaline will work. Uh, so alkaline pretreatment, we increase the pH uh, from you know eight to all the way to thirteen, and you can look at that thirteen work better. But then there's no difference between twelve and thirteen statistically. So we stick with uh, pH twelve. Okay. This is biological. So you can use um, uh, individually the white rod and brown rod fungi in in a solid state fermentation, or you can combine these two together. So when you put these two fungi together, your ethanol yield was better. So, so we advocated uh, putting these fungi together uh, to soften up the lignin. So just to show, just to, without doing anything, how much sugar is released in this process, you can see glucose and xylose yield, various pretreatment. And you can see the 3%, 4% acid, there's not much different. Uh, and then the fungal pretreatment, when you combine these two fungi, you have better sugar yield uh, in our lab experiment, okay? And then we, we went with the uh, step of how we can combine these two biological and um, acid pretreatment. Um, so we, the, the idea here is when you collect biomass in a large scale, you have to store the biomass anyway, right? So during the storage process, you can use these two fungi to spray it on the uh, biomass. Uh, uh, and then after a you know, couple of days, then you do the pretreatment steps. So in this way, you can use less acid. Um, so this is just to show you, when you use the ethanol, your acid pretreatment uh, your concentration is less. You, you don't have to use 3%, you can use 1% acid. So your acid cost is going to go down. So that, that, that's the experiment we did just to show you. You just uh, uh, use this uh, two fungi together for two days, um, and then you put those fungi in acid treatment and com compare various acid treatments. So without fungi, you need 3% acid. With fungi, Two day storage, you need only 1% acid. Okay, so this makes sense. So this will be economically viable process. Okay. Um, so that yield was not that good when you did, did the ethanol. So then we did the genetic uh, engineering. Uh, we took uh, this E. coli um, and then we just did some uh, knockout experiment. 
Um, we put some Zymomonas um, uh, gene into this E. coli uh, and try to get a better yield of um, ethanol. So want to get um, theoretical yield of ethanol. So those things are without genetically modified organism, just the uh, yeast. Now we are using this recombinant uh, E. coli just to show you. So we did some genetic knockout. So we knocked out some of the genes in this E. coli um, because this E. coli can produce from uh, sugar variety of product. It, not only ethanol, it also produces um, acid, succinate, lactate. So we knocked out the genes that produce all this product by only allow the genes that produce ethanol. So in this way, uh, when we have this recombinant E. coli, you can make uh, uh, get 95% yield. Okay, so we got this E. coli to work. Um, and, and after we did this combined pretreatment with the fungus and the acid, and just to show you the, the process. Uh, so here is your um, xylo sugar going down. Here is your growth of your E. coli and um, organic acid when there is no knockout. When you knock out those genes, you don't have any acids. You produce everything, one product, ethanol. So this is, uh, you know, almost theoretically you're getting from this process. Okay. Uh, so with, with that, we scaled up uh, this process and uh, we used uh, bagasse, um, uh, which is coming out of the, the solid waste coming out of the sugar mill um, to, uh, to do the same step combined with uh, fungi, uh, two days of storage, and then you use 1% acid and then use this recombinant E. coli, okay? And we used a um, uh, variety of enzyme to get the sugar out of this because the sugar mill, uh, they didn't care. They wanted to you know, find out how much maximum uh, sugar they can get. So if you look at it, we used a lot of different enzymes. We can live with a couple of enzymes, but we wanted to show uh, complete use of uh, the biomass. So, so in this case, we use a lot of enzyme, but I will advocate we can live with maybe a couple of enzymes. So we, we don't have to worry about uh, you know, arabinose. Those are all very small amount in the, in the biomass. We want to use all the sugar that comes out of hemicellulose. So we scaled up to five liter and then to 100 liter. Um, I'm going to show you some results from that experiment using recombinant. So here is the, the bigger scale uh, experiment. And you can see um, after the processing of the bagasse with the two days of um, fungal treatment, 1% of acid, um, your glucose uh, yield and xylose yield uh, in their fermenter, and they all went down because this E. coli can use both sugar, and both sugar went down. And then the E. coli growth went up. They are using sugar to grow. And then the total sugar, when I combine these two sugar, the total sugar go down, and then your ethanol yield coming up, okay? So in this uh, 100 liter experiment, we did not get theoretical yield yet. We still have to play with this process a little bit. Uh, um, uh, we, we got some hiccups. So if you look at it, we didn't get 40, uh, 0.49 mole. We only got uh, half of it. So we need to improve this process further. So this particular experiment, um, we combine two pretreatment. So the, the, the logic behind is uh, when the companies uh, harvest this biomass, they have to store it anyway. Uh, so during the storage, they can use these two fungi and then they can use less pretreatment. Um, so that will save some money. So that's a concept behind this research, okay. So we used the pentose and um, hexosic sugar. Now we have lignin, right? So we wanted to use lignin. So the idea here is to find an organism that could use uh, the all polyphenol that come out of lignin, come out of lignin, and then you know convert them to uh, microbial lipids and could use as biodiesel. Right? So so we can use every part of the biomass. Okay. So we, um, just to show you why we went on this microbial lipid. Uh, angle again the same story. We have we got to have the energy. We need the biomass uh, is one of those way to go. I don't want to repeat this again. Um, 
this is uh, again how much uh, energy can be produced from biomass and this is a us goal in 2022 and they're not going to achieve it um but currently we're producing 10 billion because of the government change the trump administration completely shut down this uh, and so we are not making this so hopefully this uh, yield will go up in the future in the us um so you can the process is to go through fermentation and uh, make biofuel and then uh, in the other way how they make biofuel uh, diesel is transesterification from plant uh, material right so we want to make microbial liquids as a so um, way to go make biodiesel um, so just to show you the government change uh, screwed up the whole um, process of bioenergy in the us so the last four years, the energy policies change and drill baby drill, regulations are relaxed for petroleum industry and completely shut down lignocellulosic um, um, activity in the US. Many commercial ventures went uh, bankrupt. So these are the company that I pointed out before. Um, all, most of them uh, went bankrupt. This one is still operational. DuPont in Iowa is still operational. Uh, the fulcrum is still functioning and the, the other companies went bankrupt so uh, because of government change in policy so again uh, the biodiesel concept is simple so you get your um, uh, biomass and you do your pretreatment uh, and then you you go through this uh, transesterification process and you get your biodiesel and then you get uh, glycerin as your byproduct and um, so you, the steps involved, um, transesterification steps involve your methanol and your um, glycerol is one of the product and you get variety of different uh, liquids that come out, okay, as a biodiesel. So the organism we chose was this oligogenous microbe, uh, Rhodococcus, um, Rhodococcus, um, Rhodococcus opacus is also one of the good ones. So we chose Rhodococcus, Rhodococcus, which is because it's uh, also bioremediating uh, microbes. It, it, it is very versatile. So the, these organisms can convert um, uh, the sugar into um, a phenolic compound into um, lipid inclusion bodies. And you can easily separate this. Um, so it doesn't involve any big distillation to get them out. So you just open the cell, you get the lipids out, the easy bioprocessing of getting biodiesel. Uh, so we, uh, we started out small and, and, and did a pilot plan study on this uh, in Mississippi State University with the chemical engineering department there. Um, I'm going to show you how we started We're using the rhodococcus um, with um, first uh, glucose and then we used the lignin uh, um, polyphenolic compound. Okay. Um, again, the concept of using is um, this way, uh, if you go through this um, bio, uh, microbial lipid concept, you, this is highly efficient compared to growing plants and getting the biodiesel. And um, you can you know, grow microorganisms really easily in a big tank and, and you make more out of this compared to growing plants. So, so Okay, sorry about that. And my computer is acting up today. <laughs> I'm trying to get this again started. So um, just to show that this is the concept, um, you get the, the, the lignin paste. Get the I'm sorry, Rich, the screen is not yet shown. Oh, it's not showing? Yes. Okay. I think uh, I have a problem with that. Do you want us to show your presentation? Yeah, you have it with you? Yes. Uh, Guntur, can you help us? Yes, okay. Yeah, start with this uh, slide that shows the rhodococcus. Wait, I have it. Mm -hmm. 
So you cannot see, yeah. I can see here. Okay. Yeah, go down all the way to the microbial lipid part. in the slide 110 or something Guntur yeah something like that yeah and while waiting uh, you can also ask the question in Indonesian yeah we will translate it to English for Professor Raj Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's good. Sorry about this technical glitch. It's okay. It happens <laughs> all the time. <laughs> it worked last three classes. It worked. I don't know what happened today. Okay, yeah, this is good. So this uh, this slide I was just mentioning about uh, comparing growing plants and then getting your ethanol uh, using the microbial route is nine times more. Uh, efficient. Okay, just to show you, uh, you know, if you know, when you want to grow plants and you're going to have these inputs and all that, but you don't have that in uh, uh, using microbes. Okay, okay, next one. Uh, so the concept is simple you get the lignin when you do your biomass, and the lignin is mostly phenol, and this organism can use phenol as carbon source to grow. And then, uh, and, and when you um, grow this, and they're going to, you know, with high amount of carbon in during, when you have high carbon, it's going to convert them into this microbial lipid. And then uh, the lipids can be easily removed and you get biodiesel. Okay, next slide. Uh, so we started out just to show the concept with the glucose. So we didn't use the uh, lignin, okay? So we, this, this produces the pigment and just to show how much biodiesel it can make, uh, just using sugar as a raw material. Okay, next, next one. Um, so we did the sugar analysis uh, using, um, you know, uh, liquid extraction blower and dryer method and do freeze dry pellet to look for biomass, how much biomass is produced. Okay, next one. Next slide. Uh, if you look at it here, you can see the lipid production and the glucose consumption um, uh, using different concentration of glucose, 10 gram per liter, 20 gram per liter, 40 gram per liter. So the more sugar we had, the more lipid production we had in our system. So uh, just to show this concept work, we have the lipids produced from um, sugar. So now we want to substitute the sugar with the uh, uh, phenol from lignin. Okay, next, next, next slide. And just to show these organisms, once we grow them on sugar, and uh, we got this um, uh, the oil droplets, and and we can process them. This uh, microlipid can easily broken down and can be released. So this is our organisms in Protococcus rotocrus. Okay, next one. Next slide. Can you follow next slide? Okay. So what is in this lipids? Um, so we uh, we did the analysis and these are all triglycerides. And uh, just show this uh, 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 chromatography here. Okay, next one. Um, so we had C16, C18, uh, C20. Uh, so linoleic uh, acid and uh, palmitic acid, which is a very good uh, fatty acid methyl ester profile, and this this is this is what mostly in your biodiesel. Next one. Um, we compare with the existing literature, and uh, the organism we used was uh, better. Uh, we can do it in three to five days uh, compared to others that take longer time. Even though our yield was a little less, but our uh, time of getting the lip, lipid out is, you know, shorter. Okay, next one. So with that, uh, we, we're going to use the, the lignin from sugarcane. So again, to show you how we did the pretreatment the same way we did it. 
with uh, enzymatic and weak acid, 1%. Okay, next one. So when you did that, you're getting a lot of fractions. So you get the cellulose, you get the semi hemicellulose. I showed you we using that uh, recombinant E. coli to completely use these two sugars. Now I'm gonna show you this lignin, this 21 to 32% lignin that uh, could be uh, converted to phenols. And then the phenol is gonna be used by the rhodococcus to make your bio, biodiesel, okay? Next step, next one. Um, so we uh, we just use the xylos uh, just to, uh, first we want to see whether this organism can grow in the sugar that is produced from this lignocellulosic. Um, and then we tried phenol. So we used the glucose and xylos. And um, for some reason, when we use xylos alone, it wouldn't grow. But when you combine xylos and uh, glucose together, uh, we saw growth and we saw and consumption of this sugar, okay? All right. And then they produce lipids when we use these glucose and xylose and the lipids were produced in this um, um, rhodococcus, okay? Next one. Again, what was the lipid we got when we used the lignocellulosic sugar? We again, we got palmitic and we got oleic acid, which are the good pain profile in this bacteria. Okay, next one. And just to show you, scaled up a little bit, um, just to show um, the organism also grew on these um, inhibitors. So when you do the acid treatment, you get some inhibitors. Um, these inhibitors had no effect on this um, bacteria. They grow on this uh, inhibitors as well as carbon source. Okay, next one. Um, just to show the growth on different um, uh, uh, chemical that come out of this lignocellulosic material. We have acetic acid, furfural, acetic acid, furfural, and we saw the biomass yield, we saw lipid yield. Uh, so it, this is kind of growing on all the carbon that we, put, we, we, we used in this uh, process. Okay, next one. Um, again, it produced um, uh, the FAME profile. We got uh, palmitic and oleic acid. Okay, and depending on what source you use, okay? Uh, glucose or other thing. All right, next one. And uh, now we're gonna concentrate on this phenolic part. Okay, next one. So phenol, uh, you know, is common compound, natural compound. Uh, all the lignins are made up of phenol, okay? Just to show you where the phenols are. Okay, next one. Uh, so we did the solid phase extraction to show what method we used um, to separate the um, diesel. Okay, next one. And just to show you the phenol uh, result, you're comparing with uh, phenol and glucose and phenol. It grew on phenol and when we add a little bit of glucose, it grew better with uh, uh, glucose, but it also grew with phenol. Okay, next one. Um, and again, lipid uh, um, a lipid production profile. Um, you can see the amount of lipid produced. Um, you can see glucose um, phenol alone had some problem, but when you combine with a little bit of sugar, um, you got the growth better. Okay, the lipid better. Okay, next one. And we got the same uh, fame profile um, depending on what starting material. So there is not a big difference in whether it is glucose or phenol or glucose phenol combination. We produced um, same fame. There was no change in uh, fatty acid methyl ester. Okay, next one. And then this is, I don't know, we, we want to have just spend time in this one. Uh, we did some proteomics to see which genes are turned on and uh, which genes are upregulated and, and downregulated. It's more basic uh, research, so we can later on manipulate this organism to increase our yield. Uh, we're going to go through some biochemical uh, process. Okay, next step, next slide. Uh, so if you look at this organism, the lipid metabolism uh, goes through this bad oxidation pathway. Uh, so two carbon at a time is chopped and uh, converted to acetyl-CoA and acetyl-CoA can go in, um, you know, both biosynthetic route and also degradation route. So, so this is our central thing. The organism used these bad oxidation pathways. Okay, next, next slide. 
uh, just to show you where these processes are. So we have um, this um, uh, use of this biosynthetic drug where this biodiesel is synthesized. Your starting material is your acetyl-CoA, all right? Acetyl-CoA is, and then the couple of genes are turned on depending on what is accumulating in the flask. Uh, I'm gonna show you which gene turned on depending on whether it's phenol or glucose, okay? Next, uh, next slide. Um, just to show you, when you have glucose, um, these are the uh, um, enzymes that is produced and the enzymes roll, okay? Um, so we have biotin carboxylase was high in the bacteria, uh, citrate synthase was high, malic um, protein and uh, adenylate kinase. And what these enzymes does, what are the role? Um, there are various roles, yeah, fatty acid synthesis, central metabolism, and uh, energy balance reaction, okay? Next one. And, um, and, and, and just to show you um, some more uh, putative enzymes, I have um, for degradation purpose, when you have phenol degradation, when you have phenol, all these enzymes are turned on because uh, you need to have catechol, two, three um, dioxygenase, and um, you need to have um, biotin carboxylase and all this. So, when you have phenol uh, as a uh, starting material, phenol has to be broken down. So we got these genes turned on 31, uh, look at the, the fold increase, and he got this enzyme expressed to break the phenol down. Okay, next, next one. Uh, just to show you what is going on, the, the phenol from the biomass, is uh, has to be broken down and get the carbon out. So phenol is converted to catechol and these are the pathway, but the, the end product is your acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA can be, you know, forwarded into your synthetic pathway or also degradative pathway. You can use it for energy, for the bacteria to grow, or when this accumulates, you can produce your microbial lipids, okay? Through fatty acid metabolism. So that's just to show you, that's the various level. We use phenol, we show the expression of the genes, just a little more basic and how much, uh, how many fold these uh, genes are upregulated, how much fold downregulated, down depending on whether you use glucose or whether you use phenol. Next one. So, um, so once you get your acetyl-CoA and it's a synthetic pathway, so we get this uh, lipid buildup takes place and uh, bacteria put this carbon together and make your triglyceride, okay? So this is a pathway commonly used using beta keto adipatic pathways, okay? Next one. So when, the, when this pathway is uh, produced, uh, we wanna find out uh, what, um, uh, genes are upregulated. So you need to degrade the phenol. And then once your phenol is degraded, you got this uh, uh, fatty acid metabolism. You got this 3-hydroxybutyl coenzyme. Epimerase is uh, increased upregulated 31-fold 31 31 um, when you have phenol. And, and this is what um, you know, increase in starting your uh, fatty acid synthesis uh, process, okay? And just to show you which genes are upregulated and downregulated. Okay. So just to, just to show you the holistic view, so we have this uh, lignin, uh, when you break it down, you get a variety of phenolic compound. And this variety of phenolic compound, when you use it in this bacteria, they go through the path where they already know, breaking down phenol and then synthesizing from acetyl-CoA, beta ketoadipatic pathway and beta oxidation pathway. Next, next slide. So we, uh, then we used uh, some of those model compound to show uh, how much um, um, uh, microbial lipids we can produce. So we use this lignin model compound, uh, you know, comeryl alcohol, coniferal alcohol, sinapyl alcohol in our system, okay? I'm gonna show you a few more uh, results. Next slide. Um, this also vanillic acid we use um, for hydrobenzoic acid. Okay, next next slide. And just the result. So if you compare glucose with all this uh, phenolic compound, 
you can see uh, the growth um, uh, depending on what phenolic compound the uh, organism is using. Um, almost all of those phenolic compounds are used by this organism to make your biomass and also produce your lipid. Um, so we were really surprised whatever we throw at this uh, bacteria, it, it was able to use some easily switch their genes on and off depending on what starting material uh, they're using. Okay, next one. And uh, just to show you some more result, and uh, just to show you we have the uh, vanillic acid and uh, alcohol and uh, different phenolic compounds. You see the growth and you see the personal lipid uh, production. Okay, next one. Um, uh, and then we have more phenolic model compound just to show the use of this compound. I, I, I'm sorry about it, all this are messed up. <laughs> I don't have the legends are all, all over the place. Um, and then you have the personal lipid uh, uh, production using these various uh, phenolic compounds. Next one. So just to show you from just one biomass, uh, we were able to show the use of uh, the pentosic sugar, um, hexosic sugar using recombinant E. coli, and then the lignin that uh, end up, um, you most of the time, the lignin is a waste. And um, uh, um, now people are using cogen uh, to make electricity. And we thought we could use these microbial lipids. And we just showed in the lab scale. So we in a little bit of scaled up version using glucose. And, and we need to you know, make this uh, really viable process. So you can use every bit of biomass. So nothing is going to waste. Um, just to show the sustainability concept. So lignin is also converted to this uh, microbial lipid, which is you know, basically a fame fatty acid methyl ester, and that could be used as a biodiesel, okay? And next, uh, next slide. This is futuristic. Uh, if the, because of this petroleum price, the diesel and, um, um, price is not good. So you could use this organism to use variety of you know, comp carotenoids compound uh, for, you know, cosmetic uh, industry. Um, so th that's also a possibility. Okay, next, uh, next slide. I, um, so just to show you future work, we have planned on it, we're looking for funding. <laughs> so obviously uh, we are writing grants and to look at uh, what we could use, um, you know, from this um, penal, penal come out of this, um, lignocellulosic waste, okay? And just uh, next two slides are acknowledgement, summary and acknowledgement. So the, the ethanol project, we showed a combination of uh, the fungus uh, as a biological pretreatment. So you can reduce your acid from 3% to 1%. That's gonna be a big saving for industry, okay? The next one. And uh, this is just to show funding for various when people did the work. And Rene did uh, the fungal work, he initiated the work. We published a couple of papers and then a couple of my students went with, uh, you know, with the same fungus he brought. Um, so uh, very, very um, thankful to Rene when she visited my lab, okay. I think I'll stop here. I'm sorry about uh, the whole mess, <laughs> the slide messed up, okay. Well, thank you, Professor Bupati, for a very interesting talk. We already uh, get about eight questions so far. Okay. Uh, so there's there's more coming, I believe. And okay. Guntur, would you like me to show or can you show the Slido slide? I can do. Wait a bit. Okay, here is the question. Uh -huh. The first coming from Pak Bur Samin from Mengkulu. Okay. And he asking about how about uh, maybe the biorefinery of uh, palm oil shell. So the uh, palm oil, yes, the palm oil uh, industry will produce a shell and also a fiber and also empty fruit bunch. But empty fruit bunch is mostly used so far. And yeah. he's talking about shell. 
I think uh, the, if you if you know the biomass, uh, mostly uh, composition is almost similar. I I I, I now worked with uh, Myel Shell, but uh, if you have same lignin um, uh, cellulose hemicellulose, um, we could use that. Um, yeah, all you have to do is get the raw material out, the sugar out, and the and the lignin phenol out from lignin, and. Uh, so, um, so, so it could be a good research project. You guys have to, you know, find out the best way to get your sugar and the phenol out. And uh, so you could holistically use those sugar for whatever uh, product you want to make, not only ethanol, but also, uh, you know, fine chemicals with the sugar. And then, of course, phenol could be used in a microbiolipid uh, process the way I showed you. Yeah. Rhodococcus is the common one uh, organism that you could use. Yeah. Okay, the next question is uh, I hope it answered the question, Mr. Busramin, or otherwise you can rewrite the question. Uh, next is from Ibu Risa, and she's questioning about what are the reasons of the low yield of biofuel production, especially from biomass product. So maybe biomass waste. How to obtain high yield so it can compete with the conventional fuel? Um, as I said, uh, the, the 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 process itself is um, most of them are the pretreatment and uh, enzymatic hydrolysis stuff, and the price is coming down. So the now it is commercially viable in this country. We uh, they have already operated several commercial plants. Um, the processing of this raw material is the cost is the issue. So as I said at the beginning of my lecture, the processing cost is uh, you know coming down uh, because of the research. Uh, a lot of people are doing research to cut down the cost. Um, so your question is low yield. Um, it's not the case anymore. It started out with low yield, but now it's commercialized. The um, lignocellulosic biomass, you can make it at industrial level. So uh, at least in the US, we are successful. And then also Brazil also doing this. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the main thing is cost. The cost is coming down as the processing cost, um, you know, go down. The, uh, the overall cost will come down. As I showed you in the model, they're predicting to get to 60 cents per gallon. That's a, you know, that's a very optimistic uh, model they have. So. So technically, you can make uh, yield is not an issue anymore. So. Okay. So the 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 two company that you show uh, still operational, they they actually already uh, can compete and increase right. the uh, decreasing the production cost. Yeah. That's right. Um, but uh, when they set up, they initially they got subsidies, um, and the subsidies were taken away by the. Trump administration, they don't give you any more subsidies. Um, that's why some other company collapsed. Um, that uh, the couple of companies still operational because they that their co production cost is low um, because they kind of uh, uh, have their own uh, in-house technology. They're not telling other people how they got uh, production cost low. So as I said, the bioprocessing cost is coming down every year. Yes, yes, yes. So can survive without subsidy. Uh, that, that's <laughs> very good. <laughs> a, couple are, a couple of them are still standing. A couple of them are still running. So we, we, are, we are either either they are, are lying or they are still successful. We don't know. They are still operating. So yeah. Yeah. yeah well, that's positive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The next question is from Gustin. What yeah. about the development of fermentation technology with synthetic gas substrate to produce ethanol in U.S.? Um, that's for some reason, it's uh, not a commercial operation. Everything is uh, probably, I would say, pilot scale. I, I'm not sure why. I'm not involved in syngas uh, research, but uh, whether, when I do some literature search, when I look at people, what they're doing, I did not see any big commercial operation in syngas in U.S. and um, uh, I, I I really don't know why that is because I, I I'm not, that's not my area of research. But uh, I don't see any big commercial operation in using syngas for ethanol production. Uh, maybe 
maybe it's not commercially um, you know viable process but ethanol maybe for some other um, you know product you could use that uh, so when they work out the cost of getting thin gas to ethanol they may not compete with the, the way the other people are doing it so that's the best I, uh, answer i can come up with because i don't work on thin gas yeah yeah okay thank you the next question is from Ibu Fioni from Andalas University would you please tell more about the affix uh -huh. should it be near the farm or processing unit and how do affix approach farmer for for it uh -huh. and is it better for the mixed pretreatment uh, is it better than the mixed pretreatment yeah uh, the affix is really now commercialized and it's really one of the best pretreatment in the U.S. And so the, if you look at that one slide at the Michigan State University advocating is you, you can do this cooperative small operation based on how many farmers are in a locale. So you set up a pretreatment plant there and produce your sugar and ship the sugar to the refinery. So the concept is um, breaking this down into smaller pretreatment unit uh, say maybe it um, depending on the how many farms are located so you could put one unit in there and use the FX process so FX process is safe uh, you can put near the farm it's not a problem the ammonia is recycled it's not a big issue about waste and uh, getting into the farm and uh, so that's the approach um, uh, most of the midwestern states are doing and FX uh, is uh, commercially uh, right now working so but uh, in the future that's what they're predicting you put this pretreatment plant in a cooperative scale get few farmers signed up and get your biomass transported to one area and then you do this pretreatment get the sugar um, uh, 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 and then you transport that to a refiner so yeah that's that's what they predict so the prediction is uh it's uh so continuing the question so the 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 prediction is you will have distributed pretreatment and hydrolysis process yeah while yeah. Uh, you ship the hydrolysis or sugar rich hydrolysis into more centralized for ethanol production or right. biorefinery plant that's right because the main uh, it solves main problem of transportation of biomass into the into the factory so you don't want to uh, you know spend more uh, uh, energy to transport into you know bigger uh, factory so you do that in local and then you ship the processed uh, biomass yeah that's that's what they're advocating currently yeah so kind of small scale pretreatment process yeah that's true it, it, that's why they call it cooperative uh, uh, farmers cooperative pretreatment um, operation so uh, so farmers have to get together and put their money in <laughs> set up this yeah. so and then they sell this but so once you pre-treat your biomass then your pre-treated uh, material is you know more expensive than the biomass itself so, yeah. yeah yeah although we are dealing here we'll be dealing here with a uh, sugar problem it, it is easily degraded or something yeah we need to have yeah. concentrated yeah, process, process yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah you're right you're right yeah yeah okay we go to the next question from uh, maya about pretreatment using microbe when we should choose already known bacteria or fungal fungal strain compared to local organism in the substrate that will be treated um, as I said before, a lot of people are trying to find new organisms for, for new novel enzymes. They're looking in different insect guts and different places. Um, it depends. Um, so uh, there are already uh, well-researched um, uh, organisms there that can do your pretreatment. Like I said, that white rod and brown rod that uh, Rene Sugari uh, suggested to us, that worked for us. And uh, um, so it depends. Uh, you can use the you know already reported organisms for your research, or you can go and find even better one. And you have to do a lot of research. You need to do some 
find the organisms that have better enzyme production, enzyme efficiency. So people are looking into variety of uh, insect, variety of different um, uh, you know, microorganisms. So, yeah. But is it available commercially already? The the one we saw, we did the pilot sale and then uh, last four years, this research shut down. <laughs> 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 Trump came and shut down everything off. So <laughs> funding, funding was cut for biofuels in the, in the country. Yeah. Well, let's hope not on the even, next president. Not even for, not even for research. Uh, not, even, not, even for, not even for research. All the research funded projects were taken away. That was bad. So. So yeah, everything is kind of uh, upside down right now. <laughs> yeah. So this research I did six, six, seven years ago during Obama administration. Yeah, not recently. This was all done before Trump because the funding is a problem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The next one is from Ibnu Maulana. How to maintain the inhibition possibility during fermentation due to the presence of organic acid as toxic compound from some fermenting agents for some fermenting agents? Yeah, inhibition uh, uh, compound, depending on your pretreatment. So, affects, they don't have any inf uh, inhibitory, but acid pretreatment, we do get uh, perforalin, hydroxy, methyl perforal, acetic acid. Some of those uh, could be inhibitory. So, that's a touchy one. So that's why we use this uh, rhodococcus. Um, so rhodococcus used all this uh, chemical that come out of the pretreatment. We, we didn't have any problem. But in our, uh, the first experiment we did with the E. coli, um, we, we did have uh, in our pilot scale, that's, all, that's one of the reasons our, our yield went down uh, because of this uh, inhibitory compound. So, uh, uh, we, we, we still have that uh, problem to solve. So we, we, I, I, I agree with the questioner. Yes, it is a problem. So yeah, we, we need to find some way to get the inhibitor out. So, yeah. so we need the detoxification step yeah, for that. That's exactly, detoxification steps you need to involve. But in the small scale, it worked. But when you scale up, uh, it, uh, uh, we got this problem, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Only on scale up. <laughs> that, yeah, that's... in the five liter fermenter, we didn't have any problem. We, we produced ethanol uh, uh, theoretical yield from, you know, sugar. But uh, when we scaled up, we had 50% reduction and we found out the, the, mainly the inhibitor is uh, affecting that. Okay. Well, very interesting. Yeah. The next from uh, Ibu Awalina Satya. How yeah. can we the enzyme derived from termites from hydrolyzing lignocellulosic material. Which one better compared to fungi? I think the, the last one has already been answered. Yeah, but it, the first one, how can we use the enzyme derived from termites? Yeah, people people are working on that. Um, so if you look at um, uh, termite, it, it has the same microbiome. They, it has protozoa, it has bacteria. Uh, um, most of the time, um, uh, protozoa take out the lignin and get the um, you know, uh, cellulose, semicellulose release and variety of bacteria then work on it. So the problem with termite is uh, it's not one organism that doing the job. It's like a lot of different organisms doing the job. So uh, you need to do a lot of basic research. So you need to uh, find out which organism is doing what stuff and uh, what genes are involved. So it's a little more complicated. Uh, a lot of people are working on that. Uh, termite is a good source uh, for uh, fun uh, enzyme that can you know, uh, work better than what we have currently. Um, but it, it, it's all basic research. Nothing is uh, you know, in, in went so far to applied aspects so far. So because of the uh, complexity of organism in termite. So there's a lot of organisms in there, so, yeah. Okay, so maybe it's for Ibu Awalina, you can continue the result, <laughs> this result, yeah. doing good, research good, good, <laughs> using termite. Good area to do the research, you're right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, the next one from uh, 
Pak Andi Tri Rahmadi, is there a specific rationale use of using microbial production of fatty acid derivate from lignocellulosic sugar instead of lipid existing from waste? So, yeah, yeah we, we went with uh, microbial lipid uh, as an ideal way to go, go because this particular organism um, was using every all the chemicals that come out of the uh, lignocellulosic material but yeah you could use other other um, way to deal with this um, uh, fatty acid derivatives yes um, um, I, I mean i didn't personally work on but there are people looking at different uh, way to get this um, uh, microbial um, lipids and fatty acid derivatives yeah but we only concentrated on the same fatty acid methylist uh, in our research yeah Okay, so basically it's possible, yeah? It, it, it is possible, but uh, we, we didn't go on, on that route. We, because of the bacteria we had, could use everything and convert them to oil. Why not we use this as a lipid and, and biodiesel, get your you know, certification process and get your biodiesel. So that's our rationale for using our research, yeah. Yes, and this is my question. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> very curious. Yeah. It's the name is Rhodococcus. It's it? so it may, it's supposed to be a coccus, isn't it? it but it, it, is, it is it is not a coccus. It's a misnomer. <laughs> it, oh, okay. it, it, yeah, it's a rod shape. It's a, a gram negative uh, 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 organism. Yeah, yeah. Gram so it yeah rod shape. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So it's it is not <laughs> coccus. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's a long rod shape organism. Yeah. Oh, okay. Let me continue a bit with the question. Uh, uh, was it uh, in your research you show that you are using uh, the Rhodococcus is consuming phenol, yeah? So it is the derivative of lignin. It's not the lignin itself. It is a derivative, yeah. We used all the different phenolic um, uh, compound comes out of uh, lignin. Lignin is a polyphenol. We have a lot of different uh, phenol comes out. Uh, Cumeral alcohol, syringal alcohol, all those are all component of lignin. So we use that, uh, but the material came from um, the lignin. All those phenol came from lignin. Yeah. That is, uh, and Professor Chanda's question is actually in the same line with that. Have you tried to uh, use the real lignin from biomass to produce microbial lipids? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We started out with the uh, separation of different uh, phenols from lignin and then we put the whole polyphenol and, and it did work yeah. yeah all the just the lignin we didn't even process it uh, so after we treated whatever lignin came we put it in the uh, uh, organisms and uh, it, it, it produced lipid but uh, the yield was less uh, because of the there's a lot of different components still in there so but when we separate the phenol from lignin, the yield was better. But when we put the whole lignin, uh, yield was less. But it did produce um, microbial lipid, yes. So you, basically, you don't need any pretreatment in using that. Uh... Yeah. You get your, yeah, you get the sugar out and whatever lignin left, you can use this organism to make your um, microbial lipids, yeah. yeah. Okay, and the next question from Aulia, polyphenol from lignin is uh, sorry, polyphenol from lignin is uh, was it hydrolyzed simultaneously by uh, bacteria, or uh, it does uh, it needs to have a separate process to form the phenol to be able to be consumed by the microorganism. So yeah, during the during the pretreatment process itself, because we use this uh, biological uh, pretreatment, the lignin already is broken down a little bit. So so we have the holistic lignin, and then we had a different component of lignin is liberated because of the fungi we used. Okay, and because the fungal enzyme involved. So in our case, uh, we had. A lot of polyphenol, and we also had individual phenol come out of the lake. So, uh, to answer your question, 
uh, so during pretreatment process, you could liberate some phenol out of the lignin and uh, that could be used. But if you want to get all the phenol separated, you have to do some pretreatment. Yes, you have to do some kind of pretreatment. Okay, and next from Aninomos, <laughs> what catalyzed is used in the trans esterification process to get the maximum yield? KOH, uh, calcium hydroxide, or natrium sodium hydroxide. Oh, this is, I think, it's not re really relevant, yeah? Yeah, we, we did, I mean, we did a certification to show um, the different fame and uh, uh, what we got. We use sodium hydroxide in our, uh, in our experiment. So I think both, both can be used. Potassium also can be used, but uh, I, don't, I don't see any big difference between you know, KOH or NEOH. We use sodium hydroxide. Okay, the next from Mr. Tony Hendartomo. What catalyst is used in the transesterification? Oh, this is the same? Same question, yeah. Same yeah. question, I'm sorry. And the next one is on an industrial scale to get bioethanol fuel grade, what unit is usually used? Is it molecular shift or distillation using end trainer? And if we are using the sieve, what is the time life? Uh, what is the lifespan? Of the uh, in the commercial operation, I, I'm not sure, but I think they're using the. Uh, um, I think the sieve. I think I'm. I'm not sure about the lifespan, but a uh, couple of plant I visited, they used uh, a molecular sieve. Um, I don't know how long it lasts. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, so the the plant I visited, they used the molecular sieve. Yeah, the fuel grade. Yeah. That's this is uh, probably most uh, more to be the down uh, down processing, yeah. Uh, yeah. And not not, uh, not really the bioprocess aspect of the. Not in my area. Not in yeah. my area. But, but I'm not sure how 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 uh, in a lifespan how often they have to you know change the sieve. Yeah. Yeah. The next one, oh, we still have plenty. Okay. Next one from Saskia about the pretreatment process, uh, pretreatment of lignin to sugar. Is it more profitable to use the microbial process compared to the chemical? And which do which company, which uh, which one do you the does the company usually prefer? Um, I mean the pretreatment told you before. Um, you can use the um, there is pretreatment to, to break up your biomass to get your uh, cellulose, semicellulose, and lignin. But the lignin is basically phenol. Lignin, there is no sugar. But um, the, the pretreatment, as I said, depending on the company, like so most of them are using FX, but I used in my research weak acid uh, pretreatment combined with the uh, fungus. So, um, so your question is, uh, which is profitable? It's uh, depending on, uh, on the company that uh, what their pretreatment they they uh, advocate. So if you look at some of the company I showed you in my earlier presentation, a lot of people are using FX, and uh, we also have acid pretreatment is very popular. Yeah. Uh, ionic liquid is still in research scale. I never saw any big commercial operation ionic liquid. So. Okay, next one. Or is there any microbe that can pretreat and also ferment the sugar into ethanol? Uh, He's is, asking about the yeah, super box. That, yeah, yeah, that is that's the next step. That's uh, people are already doing. Let's get consolidated bioprocessing. So you, you, but I don't think any organism that naturally does that uh, uh, from biomass to ethanol, but you do genetic engineering, people are already uh, doing that. They put your uh, pretreatment enzyme gene into the organism. You put the pentosic and, and hexosic sugar fermentation gene in the one organism. So you can do that. E. coli can do that now. But um, everything is in probably, I would say, pilot scale. Nothing is commercialized, but uh, yeah. But again, it's the cost, because once you make this genetically engineered organism, it's not stable. It can be stable for maybe 10 generations, and it, it, it will lose uh, some of those um, activities. So it loses the gene. So you need to constantly reconstruct your 
uh, genetically engineered organic stem for your process. That's going to cost add on cost to the company. So, so there's a lot of you know kinks to be worked out. But it, it is theoretically, technically, it is possible. Yes, one organism genetically manipulate, put all the genes in one organism. They can take your biomass, your end product is ethanol, uh, butanol, whatever you want, your end product. You can, you can do that. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it, it it will be possible in the future, but we have to be really careful, yeah. Otherwise, our forest will convert it into <laughs> ethanol <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> okay, the next one from Ayunda. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there uh, any competition mm -hmm. issue between the food sector and energy sector uh, regarding the use of? corn kernel for bioethanol in the u.s yeah um currently they overproduce the corn uh, we don't have any problem uh, uh, because the the corn industry is um, you know so matured uh, technology wise so they produce enough corn for food and also for fuel um, so as i said before we in the u.s they make seven billion gallon of ethanol from corn every year um, so far, our food price uh, didn't go up, and um, food price is very stable. Uh, they produce enough corn to make both fuel and food. So it's not an issue in U.S. at least. But, but as the population goes up, in probably it'll be a problem. That's why they advocate lignocellulosic ethanol instead of corn ethanol. Yes. Mm -hmm. The next one, how much the price of crude oil when biofuel more economical than gasoline oh, and when biofuel will be more economical than gasoline or oil from the petroleum yeah. and what is equivalent ethanol price versus uh, crude oil? What is your uh, estimation? Yeah, if you look at one of the figures I showed you um, that has this, the 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 dollar per gal gasoline, uh, I mean, uh, the oil price, uh, anywhere from $15 a barrel of oil to $60. That was a big fluctuation. But uh, uh, ethanol can be competitive if the oil price is uh, anywhere from $45 to $50 per barrel of crude oil. So uh, in that uh, price range, ethanol will be highly competitive. If the oil is you know, less than $40, uh, ethanol cannot compete with that. So, uh, so that's the, if you look at that figure, we show you the processing cost and what is the price of the um, oil that um, could be competitive for ethanol. So I would say anywhere from 40 to $50 price range, ethanol could be competitive, yes. All right, uh, the, the next question is, uh, how does the chemical process compare to produce bethanol from corn and sugarcane as a feedstock? I, I never worked with, you mean uh, pretreatment or a thermochemical route? I'm, which, this question is for thermochemical? Uh, I, I don't know, this is a pretreatment chemical process or a thermochemical route? Maybe the pretreatment process, yeah. Uh, I think uh, the sugarcane, oh. if you, uh, as the corn and sugarcane, um, if you start as a raw material, that will be uh, cheaper to make ethanol compared to lignin cellulose. Again, because of the pretreatment, you need to get the sugar out of your biomass. That is one of those expensive steps. Whereas Sugarcane, you're getting a sugar come out of sugarcane. In corn, you get starch, and amylase is so cheap, uh, the enzyme. Uh, you get, uh, you know, a penny, uh, you, they give a gallon of amylase, so it's so cheap. Um, so we, the lignocellulosic pretreatment is more expensive than if you start your raw material, either corn or sugarcane, yeah, as a feedstock. Okay, but, the last question. The, the catch, uh, the, the problem with corn and sugar cane, you have to grow corn, you have to grow sugar cane, but you're putting um, investment to grow them. You know, you need to take that into account. <laughs> so, whereas in dignus cellulose, you're using the waste coming from agriculture. So you get your food, you get your waste, and that waste is what you're trying to make ethanol. So, yeah. 
dari sini ya. Yeah. Yes, that is a, the second generation yeah, and the difference yeah. between second generation and the first generation. Yeah. The last question is from Ibu Reni. Uh, it's not appearing in the Slido. Ibu Reni, do you want to ask yourself or should I ask it? Okay, I will read the question. Do you see any change? For the bio bio fuel research and industry, is, uh, is there any chance that this this topics and this industry will rise again? Since uh, you will have a new president soon, <laughs> I, we are all happy. <laughs> the election is over. The new president is. Uh, uh, if you if you look at his uh, election promises, he is under green green new deal. So so. Uh, he wanted to use, uh, you know, biofuel, solar energy, wind energy. Uh, so we are all very hopeful. Um, there will be more funding and, there'll be, you know, better energy production. So it will be more diverse, uh, diversified energy portfolio compared to Trump. It's 100% oil. He, he doesn't want to do anything else. But now we are hopeful that new government will... Uh, at least he promised he, uh, Biden when he when he ran for election he's going to use all other resources not uh, not petroleum so he's going to cut the subsidy down to petroleum industry so and he's going to put more subsidy to other uh, uh, energy sector so we'll see what happens <laughs> yes we'll see <laughs> just hope. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the rise of the bioenergy again in the US. That's right. That's right. It's a cyclical thing. Who is in the office and uh, <laughs> in, in politics is a big thing. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, the time is, I think, very limiting. It's already one minute to nine. Okay. Professor, do you want to have something to say before we close the meeting? Yeah. Yeah, just to say something because uh, this one is the uh, the end of our lecture uh, lecture from Raj uh, this okay. semester. Probably you want to say something regarding the environmental biotechnology or bioprocessing, and just please, uh, Raj. Okay, that's that's good. Uh, I was very happy to be part of your uh, this lecture series, and uh, we we covered a little bit of bioremediation, wastewater treatment, and, uh, you know, bioprocessing. So uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, uh, some of those materials are useful to the students. So thanks. Yeah. All right. All right. Good luck to the students. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. Good luck to see you again uh, next year with the okay. other topics. Bobby, uh, Gunter, could you take the... The picture of us. Okay, but wait a bit. Closing. I will stop the streaming first in the YouTube. Yeah, I think we need to close in the YouTube. So the student, could you? Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Uh,